All right. The title of tonight's lesson is Creation. We weren't titling them back yet. Now, Jason had me start titling all the sermons shortly after that. Um, I originally did this study in December of 2015, almost three years ago, First Timothy. Never done Second Timothy. I don't know why. Uh, that seems like one I would have covered. Maybe I did in my old computer, but I don't have notes on it. So uh, we're going to be doing, in that sense, Second Timothy for the first time. And uh, it'll be four chapters. Um, but getting back to verse 1 of chapter 1 of First Timothy, the very first verse, I hardly ever spend a lot of time on verse 1 in Paul's epistles. Because Paul's epistles, verse 1, usually begins something like this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, chosen or appointed by him, chosen by him um, uh, to preach to you or to preach the gospel. Similar things to that. But look at, uh, and this will sound the same to you until we start breaking it down. Verse 1 of chapter 1 of First Timothy, Paul wrote, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. doesn't sound a whole lot different from any verse 1 of Paul's epistles, but it, it says something there in this verse 1 that got me thinking three years ago when I was putting it together. And it turned in, I think it's the only time in a, Paul, a Pauline epistle that I've ever taken one whole night to talk about verse 1 of his epistle. And we're going to do that. We're going to review that again because it blessed me when I went through it. So we're going to review it because we can. And I like it. All right? So certain things in here stuck out to me. So uh, let me read it again. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior... And Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Why, the first question, why would Paul refer to God as our Savior when he is normally talking about God the Father when he uses that term? Now Jesus, God the Son, is God too. But usually when Paul's talking about God the Son, he will be talking in the terms of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, or something of that nature. When he's speaking about God the Spirit, you'll see the word Spirit in there somewhere. When he uses just the word God, he's usually referring to Jehovah God. So, three years ago, this caught my attention. And it caught it again when I was kind of looking at um, uh, 1 Timothy to get my mind thinking about 2 Timothy. Why would Paul refer to God as a Savior? If I had come up to any of you before we began this and said, Who's your Savior? You'd have said, Jesus. Right? I mean, that's evangelical doctrine. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. But here, Paul uses the term, An apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior. God our Savior. And then he talks about Jesus. And the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So he's got God saving us and Jesus being our hope. All right? So, there are several New Testament scriptures that refer to God as Savior. 1 Timothy 2.3, 1 Timothy 4.10, Titus 1.3, Titus 2.10, so forth. Titus 4.3, a lot of them in Titus. And Jude 1.25. Um, there are several other New Testament scriptures that refer to Jesus as Savior, and there are a bunch of them. But I gave you some examples, Ephesians 5.23, Philippians 3.20, and so forth. You can look all them up. So why this confusion? Why doesn't the New Testament simply call Jesus the Savior? After all, He died for us. Now, I want to show you this enigma isn't only about who our Savior is, God the Father or God the Son. It shows up in other ways. Genesis 1.1 in the beginning, God, Jehovah in other words, created the heaven and the earth. John 1, verses 1 to 3. 
In the beginning was the Word. Now we found out in verse 14, I didn't put that down, but in verse 14 it identifies who is meant by the Word. It said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word there is God the Son, Jesus Christ, the one who took on human form. So here it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now listen, all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Again, Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John 1.3, All things were made by Him, who? Jesus. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So the above passages there in Genesis and John show us a similar phenomenon, a little phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenon. All right. Yeah, stay out until I get this word right. (laughs) We don't want any uh, English literature, not literature, grammar person in here while I'm trying to work my way through that word. Uh, So the same phenomenon uh, we see here where it identifies in one area of Scripture God the Creator, another area of Scripture where it's almost always, when it's used that way, talking about God the Father. And another area of Scripture, God the Son as the Creator, and goes so far to say there isn't anything that that wasn't made by Him. Alright? So, God the Father is seen as Creator in Genesis. Jesus the Son is seen as Creator in John. So, In the gospel story, who is seen as the main player in procuring our salvation? Jesus or God? Now, again, Jesus is God. But when we use that word all by itself, without God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, anything like that, almost always we understand it to mean God the Father, Jehovah God. All right? So, when you look at the... Gospel story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. When you look at the gospel teaching in Paul's epistles, who is seen as the main player in procuring our salvation, Jesus or God? The, and of course the answer was, uh, the, uh, in the gospel story, Jesus is the main player. The overwhelming majority of the narrative is about Him. As a matter of fact, the New Testament tells us that in this dispensation, it pleases the Father that the fullness ought to dwell in Jesus. He wants our attention on His Son. All right? So Jesus is the main emphasis of the New Testament, the New Covenant. So, so why God our Savior. Now, then why does God refer, uh, Paul refer to God as Savior? Now look at John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 is just as fantastic. We usually stop at the end of verse 16 when we're quoting Scripture. But verse 17 said, And God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Isn't that a wonderful verse? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. God did not send Jesus to bring sinners to their knees unless they're going to their knees to repent. He sent Jesus to save that the world to offer salvation to the world. That's why He sent Jesus. To give us an opportunity to be saved. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit, we just don't talk that way anymore. You know what, Daryl? To wit. Or in my case, to half wit. But anyway, that's another story. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us 
the word of reconciliation. That's one of my favorite Pauline verses. One of my favorite. That verse right there, verse 19, tells me how God did this wonderful thing of saving me. Through the gift of giving His Son, God, He didn't find it because He always had it. God's known everything from eternity past. But putting it in human terms, he found a way to save me and still keep justice. And still be just. The wages of sin is death. My sin earned me separation from God. A holy, just God must recognize that justice demanded an eternal separation of me from God. But God found a way, again, humanly speaking, God never searched this way out. He's known it from eternity. So speaking as theology, God didn't find this way. But I like to put things in human terms sometimes so we understand it better. Humanly speaking, there was no way to save me. I was powerless to save myself in Romans 5. Absolutely powerless to save myself. I was lost Justice demanded that I die, that death being eternal separation from God. Justice demanded it. A holy God, a just God, must recognize what justice demands. And in His Son, He found, for the lack of a better word, a loophole. How to be just and still forgive me by creating a body for a son and to have his son keep the law of Moses for 33 years so that the law would judge him as having not spot or wrinkle so that he could be my sacrificial lamb and when he did that when Jesus died he paid for my sins. That's how He saved me. My sins have already been paid for. But here's the part I like. Here's how He keeps me saved. He no longer counts my sins against me. Verse 19. Verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5. To wit that God was in Christ Reconciling the world. That means settling the difference between God and sinner. Reconciling the world unto Himself. And here's how He did it. Not imputing or recording their trespasses onto them. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. On my worst day, when I fail immeasurably... God does not record that failure in the record book of heaven because Jesus already paid for it. Praise God. So the Bible says that we ought to forgive one another even as God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven us. Right. Jesus purchased my forgiveness from His Father. He purchased it. So, when the devil says, you've got to punish Dave, Jesus stands up and said, He already did at Calvary. He already punished David. I suffered that punishment. Yeah. Dave is paid for every wit hole. There's not one thing that he can ever do as a believer that I will put down in the record books of heaven. He has been forgiven. That's how He keeps us saved. Otherwise, we'd be saved and lost. Saved and lost. Every time we sin, we'd be saved. And then when we sin, we'd be lost. And then we'd uh, repent and be saved and then sin and be lost. So to be, be truly saved, in other words, walking in a constant relationship with God as my Father, He came up with a legal way to not only remove my sins past, but never record my current and future sins against me in heaven. That's what that verse means. Alright? So, 
Why is it calling God our Savior in verse 1 up on top there? Because God was the author of our salvation. Jesus was the means that God used to bring it about. Now, I don't know if any of you went to The Shack, the movie. It was an interesting movie. A lot of evangelicals said, don't go to that. They don't like the way the man told the story. Sometimes, I think, some evangelicals need to lighten up. Um, The author, in my mind, was not calling God the Father a black woman. He was merely saying that God could appear to anyone however He wants to appear to them. That's all. Uh, and what the evangelicals wrestled with this, I think that must have been one of the big points they wrestled with. Papa, that's before he had his daughter murdered and fell away from his relationship with God, his wife always called God Papa. Isn't that an intimate thing? That is neat. Amen? And so, the black woman in the shack, he said, you can call me Papa if you prefer. So, I I mean, the shack is not a doctrinal book. You don't read the shack or go to the movie the shack to form doctrine. This is the doctrinal book. We form doctrine from that. It's a story. It's a storyteller telling a story. But he hit on some points in that story. Now, there were some points he hit on that I'm not particularly crazy about. Uh, If you watch the movie, uh, Everyone's His Favorite, uh, it almost sounds uh, that the author believes everybody's going to heaven. I would to God I could believe that, that I I don't find that anywhere in the Scripture, which is the book of doctrine. So... You know, I could go to a church and hear a preacher and agree with 80% of the things he said and disagree with 20 and still like the preacher. They don't have to hit every point the same way I do. And I hope people can like me when they disagree with a point. I mean, I don't know why anyone ever would. But (laughs) if they did, I hope they could still like me. But anyway, some of the things in the story that really moved me was... When they were talking about Jesus dying, and it showed the nail print scars in the character Jesus in the movie, then he noticed that the Father had the same scars, and the Holy Spirit had the same scars. Where did he get that? I believe he got it right here. God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Only one of them three had a body. That was Jesus. All three of them, in a technical way, died on that cross that day. Only one could physically die as we understand death. You had to be physical, have a physical body, to die the way we understand death. So only Jesus died. But God was in Christ when Jesus died. I've told you before they've never had an argument. Anything one felt, they all felt. You don't think when God the Son hurt that God the Father and the God the Spirit didn't say, Ouch! They're so connected we can't comprehend it. God was in Christ. Sure, it was Christ on the cross. But God was in Christ on the cross. So it is not technically wrong in any sense of the word to say, God, my Savior. Not only did He initiate salvation by so loving the world that He sent His Son, He was in His Son every step of a 33-year human history. Every last step until a fragment of a moment when he turned his back on his son and Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When Jesus literally at that moment inherited all the sins of the world. And Isaiah tells us that sin separates man from God. 
And so for a fraction of a moment, the most agonizing fraction of a moment in the eternal existence of Jesus, he was separated from his Father momentarily while he nailed my sins to the cross. For a brief moment, and I can't comprehend the feeling that Jesus had when he said, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? An eternal unity that is unlike any unity we can imagine. But it's like a unity we will one day realize experientially. Anyway, can you see why I wanted to share this? I looked this over and I thought, Wow! Wow! Wow, wow, wow! i got to share this. So, here I am. Since I'm the one putting it together, I kind of get to decide. So, so I, I have to share it. So, in the story of salvation, Jesus is the main biblical character. In the creation story, the Father is the main player. You read Genesis 1, and it's God this, and God this, and God that, and God this. He's the main story. So, and in the Old Testament, the overwhelming majority of the narrative is about God the Father. Just calls Him God. Alright? So, uh, you got the New Testament mainly about God the Son. Um, the Old Testament mainly about God the Father with pro- pro- uh, prophecies pointing toward God the Son without the prophets really knowing it. And then you got God the Spirit inspiring everybody to write the Old and New Testament. They're all doing their thing. Amen? And all those things harmonize and fit perfectly together. So if the old story is mostly about God the Father, then why does John refer to Jesus as the Creator? Now it's not as easy to see Jesus in the story of creation as it is to see God in the story of salvation. God the Father is everywhere in the story of salvation, but not as out front as Jesus, God the Son. But in creation, you read Genesis 1, 1, I mean the first chapter of Genesis, and you see God, 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 and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. So you think, where's Jesus in all that? So you see here, I have some um, verses down here. Genesis 1, 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. That seems to mean, as you read it in other translations, that at that time in creation, there was a greenhouse effect where there was water up in the sky. And it was separating the waters down here from the waters up here, creating land. All right? That seems to be what that narrative is about. So God said, let it happen in verse uh, um, 6. And then in verse 9, And God said, let the waters under the heaven be, be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God said, it was so. Uh, verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the, of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them uh, be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And later it said, and it was so. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has light and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. The first heaven. Again, the first heaven, Paul got caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven is our atmosphere, our sky. The second heaven is space. The third heaven is wherever God is. All right? So, he's using the word heaven here. uh, That may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Uh, Then verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and the beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Verse 26, And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, 
And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And how many of you know there's a lot of creepy things creeping? And we're to have dominion over them. Amen. Flip her over. Where is Jesus in that narrative? Now, because I kept these verses just showing the actual God said for the creation of the uh, six days. Remember the seventh day he rested. So I just gave that narrative. And sometimes you have to read another verse or two to get, and it was so. And God saw that it was good. All right? But uh, everything God said, let there be, it was so. It came into existence. But where's Jesus in the narrative? John knew. John saw Jesus in the abundance, in abundance in that creation narrative. He saw him so much that he said all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John saw Jesus in that creative story. I don't think Moses did when he wrote it. I don't think he. What did they know about Jesus? At that time, they didn't know much about the Spirit. They would have thought that the Spirit was just the Spirit of God, the same person. They just knew Jehovah. God kept revealing Himself as Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah uh, Rope, and so forth. Uh, he kept revealing Himself as history went forward uh, to the human race in different ways. But it was always Jehovah this, Jehovah that, Jehovah the other. Now, where did uh, did he see Jesus in that creative our creation narrative that I just read to you? Where did he see him? Notice what John calls Jesus in John one one. He calls him the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, And the Word became flesh. John understands that Jesus is the Word. And Moses kept saying in the creation account, And God said. And God said. Creation happened every time God said. And when after it says, and God said, what do we have? We have words of what God was saying. Let the waters above the firmament be separated from the waters under the firmament. Words, and God said. God said, let there be two great lights in the skies, one to rule the day and the other to rule the night. God said. What does said mean? They're the words of God. Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And there is a sense in which John envisioned every time God opened His mouth and said, I just wondered, who is He talking to? Was he telepathic? You know, we see everything through the, the idea of people. We see everything through the idea of people. Uh, God created us in His image, and we here on earth like to fool around creating Him in ours. We like to bring Him down to our level so we can understand Him better. Uh, so we see this old man with a big beard standing up and literally saying, God said, let there be! Why would he shout? There was nobody listening. (laughs) Kind of like me when I watch football. You stupid idiots! They can't hear me. (laughs) Can't hear a word I'm saying. Why yell? They're not listening. They're getting ready for the next down. I'm pulling my hair out. 
And they're not listening. They're just getting on to the next tunnel to decide what they're going to do next, right? God said might not mean what we think when I say. Not important what it means. But it could simply mean that God winked at Jesus and Jesus got busy. I don't think. They've never had, again, I can't stress this enough, they've never had an opposing view. They don't sit down for a board meeting. God the Father doesn't look at God the Spirit and say, what do you want to do? And how about you, Jesus? They don't have to have that discussion. What one wants, the other wants. And what one has always wanted, the other two have always wanted. It's just beyond... You can't bring that down to human terms. You can't find three people that have always wanted the same thing. Why do marriages work? Why is John... Or, or John would be. Unfortunately, uh, he suffered the loss of his wife. But Jack over here, 59 years now, married to the same woman. I will guarantee you, if you sit down and talk to Jack after this service, what he thought wasn't always what Deanna thought. And what Deanna thought wasn't always what he thought. You talk, Barb and I on Monday be married 50 years. And what I thought isn't always what she thought. What she thought is always what I think, right there. <laughs> yeah. At least after I know what she's thinking, it's always what I think. But i uh, got to keep the lady happy. If the woman ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But in heaven, there's never a board meeting. They never talk it out. They've always felt the same about everything. So when we read the narrative and God said, were there real words the way we understand words or was it just the Holy Spirit inspiring Moses to write what you and I could draw a picture of in our mind so we could understand it? Did God actually have to look into the vastness of nothing and say, let there be and there was? Or did He just give His son a wink and His son went to work? The way I envision it, God the Father thought it. If there were any actual words spoken, the words spoke them. And then the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. That's the way I envision creation. Jehovah thunk it. I don't know why I like that word. It's not really a word, is it? But I like it. It's a word to me. God thunk it thought it would be the correct way on this way. God thunk it, Jesus uttered it, and the Spirit went to work on it. And together, God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created. What John says about Jesus, other than calling Him the Word in chapter 1, he could have said about the Holy Spirit. What Moses said about God the Father, he could have said about any one of the other two. They are inseparable. They do everything as one. They work in unison. So, in the Genesis account, we think we only see two. The Father said, let there be. God said, let there be. And the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. Where is Jesus? I contend He's right where John saw Him. He's the Word. And God, Jesus, not God the Son, but God said the Word, Jesus. God thunk it. Jesus, in human terms, spoke it. He's the active ingredient. He's the Word. And then the Holy Spirit mixes it all together. And I think that's the very same way the new birth happens. God thinks it. Jesus goes to work. And the Holy Spirit gets its hands in there. And voila, my name is written down on the Lamb's Book of Life. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, 
said, in some form or another, let there be in their wants. God looked at a sinner named Dave and thought what the Holy Spirit had always thought and thought what God the Son had always thought. And however the Word works, whether there were actual words between the three of them or simple words in the mind telepathically. I don't know. It's above my pay grade. God thought it. Jesus in some way spoke it. And the Holy Spirit went to work in this creature. And bam! Out of nothing came life. It's as great an act of creation as the Genesis account in the beginning of the Bible. It was just as impossible. There was no life in me. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. And God thought it. Jesus said it. And the Holy Spirit went to work in it. Hovered over the waters. And creation happened. Oh, I want to I want to preach this the next five Sundays. Is that okay? I I just I tell you this just massages my mind. It says, "Wow, God is everywhere. God the Father is throughout the Scripture. Anything you're reading about Jesus, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. Holy Spirit was filling Christ. He had the Spirit without measure." No limitation. God was in him. The Holy Spirit was in him. The Holy Spirit was in him in a different way than he's in us. Not only because it was without measure, but Jesus said it's expedient or necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Father will not send the Comforter. So when the Comforter was filling Jesus a hundred percent, He couldn't fill Peter yet. He couldn't fill John yet. And Jesus said, till I go away, He can't come and do what He's about to do. And they all work together now. Jesus said, whatever you need, ask the Father in My name. And He'll do it. And guess who's interceding inside of us with groanings that don't be uttered, cannot be uttered because we don't know how to pray. That's right. you don't. The Holy Spirit's in here massaging, groaning inside of us. Pray for this. So once we catch on, we say, Father, do this in Jesus' name. And remember, Jesus' name isn't a magic formula like hocus pocus. When I pray in Jesus' name, it's a mature understanding in my mind. I cannot approach God through any goodness of my own. I have to approach God dressed in the the holiness of His Son. I come to Him dressed in Jesus. Only when I understand that can I do it confidently. If I think I'm going to God in my own righteousness, I can never pray in faith because I know me. But if I approach God in Jesus' name, God knows Jesus. Amen? God knows that Jesus took every sin I've ever committed away from me and cleansed me from all unrighteousness. There is nothing separating me from a holy Father because of Jesus. So I go and I remind God not that He needs reminded, but I need reminded. So I go in Jesus' name, understanding God, my faults, Do not disannul this prayer because I'm not coming standing in my goodness. I'm coming dressed in the righteousness of Your Son. In Jesus' name, do this, Father. Do what? What the Holy Spirit has been massaging inside of me. Pray for this groaning in me. 
everywhere. You see God the Father. You see God the Son. And you see God the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what you're talking about that's God. They're always there. 